All right. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the principles that um, I find very useful for automating data analysis, um, and then talking about a specific pipeline that I've developed recently for TDT data. Um, but the kind of general principles and approach should be universal for, for other uh, programming needs that require automation. Um, so just kind of as an overview, um, in science, we start with some sort of uh, data acquisition system. And then we eventually want to have like analyses that we can then visualize and run statistics on to make conclusions about the world. Um, and the analysis pipeline is everything that happens from collection to the final product. Um, and oftentimes we spend extensive amounts of time thinking about what sorts of algorithms we're going to apply to our data. Um, for example, this is just a, uh, everything is going to be related to photometry today. So in this case, you probably think extensively about how you're going to fit your signals and then compute your uh, normalizations on top of that. Um, but this can be more elaborate in the case of like two photon imaging or any other uh, number of recording uh, mechanisms. Um, but then people don't often or think about uh, how the actual process of applying these uh, algorithms to your data um, can be done in a, a more efficient way. Um, many times people get kind of trapped in this manual uh, stage where instead of doing batch execution, they end up just like running everything through GUIs or performing single file processing. Um, but there's a better way, which is like trying to automate this, um, where instead of using GUIs and single file processing, you just utilize functions and batch processing. And I think in many cases, people know that their, their manual pipeline isn't like the best way to approach their analysis, but uh, it's unclear kind of like how to take your manual work and then put it into a more automated uh, approach. So, uh, pipelines um, can come in many different flavors, but as we just kind of discussed, it, it's everything, all the steps in between the initial collection to your, your final product. Sometimes it looks something like this, where you have many different programs that you have to use on your data. Um, like, for example, I, I know people that use MATLAB to pre-process their data, but then they use an extractor written by Scott in order to extract the Met Associates data, and then an R script written by me to extract the uh, Arduino data. And then from there, you have to like kind of manually move data around um, and then sometimes compare against paper logs. And then this kind of web of data moving around uh, makes it difficult to kind of reproduce this in any systematic way. Um, and it also makes it difficult to kind of backtrack um, how this data got here um, uh, uh, through this, this sort of web. And kind of the ideal case that I've worked towards myself, um, definitely not quite there yet, but it's getting closer every day, is just to have instead um, a, a systematically uh, recorded data log for each type of data, and then just single functions that are used to then be executed by a single analysis sheet. So from one analysis sheet, you can call functions to do all these operations. Um, so that way it's very, very systematic and, and easy to track the data points that you've created. So the first part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the general principles for kind of like automating uh, any sort of pipeline. And then I wanna talk about the specific application of doing fiber photometry data. It's just so you can have a, a kind of a case study uh, in the application. I'm not gonna focus on discussing kind of like the different forms of fitting and normalization. Um, I know we have talks coming down the line. I'm gonna be focused more instead on kind of like automation um, and, and dynamic data processing. And feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, so, uh, one kind of question is, 
um, when is it appropriate to create a pipeline? Um, or, and when is it more appropriate to do something that's a little bit less uh, uh, rigorous? So I like to think of it in terms of a cost benefit analysis, where imagine you have like files on the x-axis here, on the y-axis you have the amount of time it takes in man hours to uh, analyze each one of these files. So the non-automated approach has a very little amount of time that's spent on your initial files. Like it's just learning how to, let's say, use the GUI. Um, but then it has a very high floor where there's only so fast that you can go like clicking through it without making mistakes. The automated approach has a lot more kind of time spent up front. Um, but once it's complete, then you've dramatically reduced the amount of time it takes a file to produce indefinitely. So you got to kind of think about the amount of time spent like creating it versus the amount of time you save. And if you save more time in the long run than it costs up front, then it's always going to be worth creating some sort of automated pipeline. And this is especially true for something that you're going to be collecting for an extended period of time. Like in my case, I'm setting this up for fiber photometry for my projects for the rest of my, my postdoc, but also this pipeline will be used by other people in the lab. In the end, it's going to save us an extraordinary amount of time compared to doing anything manually along the way. So that's the first one, just saving, saving time. Uh, another reason why to create it is, again, the, the confidence that I described earlier. So if you get to the end of this and you're publishing your paper, and then a reviewer asks a question like, how easily can you follow your data points back to the source to verify that, that the data is correct? And then the last one is that you can reanalyze your data easily. So let's say you get to the end of collecting all your data, like preparing your plots for a paper, and then you realize that something's wrong. Like how long would it take you to go back and reanalyze everything? And then similarly, like let's say you find a new algorithm that you wanna to apply to your data. How easy would it be to go back and then apply the algorithm to your old data? Like, would it require you to go back and do this manually, or could you just hit run and then automatically do it? So there are a number of barriers to automation that I've detected in my own work and then also in the work of other people. Um, the most obvious is difficult to import data. So data that's um, on handwritten logs, like really nice for collecting it quickly, but obviously taking that and putting it into a digital format can be very cumbersome. Um, especially if you're trying to do anything long-term. Um, a, a less obvious example is Excel. So oftentimes people will make sheets that are very nice to read uh, as a person, but trying to read this into any sort of programming language is incredibly difficult. Um, we talked more extensively about that in my last talk. I'm not gonna focus on that today, but the solution to that is to keep everything in tidy format in my mind. Um, the next is inconsistent data. So if your data is different within your, your data frames or between your data frames, all of this is going to impair your ability to uh, uh, do anything in an automated fashion, especially variable names. Like that's like the most common problem. Um, if you create a lot of tables, you need to be extremely careful to keep everything consistent, um, or you can try to have just one data, data table instead. Um, Kind of along with that is inconsistent folders or file naming. So if you have differential hierarchies for all of your experiments, um, trying to do any uh, automated analysis is gonna be much more challenging, not impossible, but it's gonna be uh, easier to do if you have a very consistent uh, hierarchy across all of your uh, experiments and analyses. Uh, the next is duplicate analyses. And I've seen this a lot where um, you'll create one analysis and then for the next experiment, you'll like tweak it a little bit and improve it. And the next one you do the same thing. Uh, being able to, it, it's very difficult to then go back and see exactly how each data set was analyzed. Um, so oftentimes it's, it's better to try to keep that all centralized instead of having it diffuse like this. And the last one, which is probably the least obvious is um, something that I found in my own work that building parameters manually at the top of your scripts is a very um, it's very easy to do when you're writing the script initially, but it makes it much more challenging to look back and see what you've done, 
and it makes it very difficult to re-execute the files if you want to reanalyze them in any way. Um, and we'll touch on this one in a little bit more detail in a second. So the principles uh, to instead facilitate automation, um, which kind of address some of the problems I just outlined. One is centralized storage. So instead of having everything dispersed across a few different folders, keeping everything in a single folder, and then having a single log um, for that folder just forces you to be consistent. Like you don't even have the opportunity to be inconsistent with your fo uh, folder hierarchies. You don't have the opportunity to inconsistently name your variables because you only have like one location and one log. Um, so this is something that, that I've started doing for all my work and it's already made my life a lot easier. Um, the next is tabulated parameters. So like I touched on, the defining the parameters at the top of the script is an easy way to write your program. But in the long run, it's often easier if you instead have your parameters defined within an external spreadsheet that's saved and then import it and then pull the parameters out of that sheet. Um, so the advantage here is that you can save this with the, the actual like file name, let's say, in a single row in a data table that also contains like say like notes from your recording session, like details about the animal, like the groups, that kind of thing. Um, and with that, you can also keep the parameters that you use to analyze your data. Um, and you can re-execute it easily by just changing the parameters in the table. Um, and then you could just uh, re-execute it with a whole different host of parameters if you'd like to. Okay, and then the next one's a little bit um, more of a high level uh, point, which is something that I've thought about pretty recently, which is the idea of agnostic pre-processing. So um, like we talked about, the you're eventually getting to your analysis where you have to be combining data from multiple sources usually. So for the examples today, we have, let's say Meta Associates data and then you have fiber photometry data. Um, it's often easier if you, keep these as separate as possible until the last moment when it's necessary to combine them. Um, and by agnostic, I mean that the initial pre-processing should be done with as little user input as possible. That is really gonna enable a lot of automation because that way you don't need to be doing anything differently for your different experiments. You could just have a single function that can be executed independent of anything that went on in that behavioral session. Um, independent of what else might have been like recorded during the, the behavior. And then you have a uniform data output at the end of this, um, and then you can read it into your analysis. And at this point, you're gonna, you can have a lot of user input. So every experiment is going to be slightly different. So at this stage, it makes sense to have a lot of like a, a very low amount of automation because of the quirks of whatever experiment you're doing. And then having the uniform data format here is, is really useful because now you can start adding on additional, let's say like behavioral measurements, additional recording um, uh, approaches. But so long as this stage is uniform, then the analysis is very easy to execute. So you're able to read in the data from different sources. It doesn't matter if it was a two photon signal or if it's a fiber photometry signal because everything's formatted the same, your variables are the same then you can very easily process that data just like you'd already written for a different analysis. So yeah, this is, uh, the idea here is just that the more the more you can have it run um, without user input, the easier it will be to, to automate it. Okay, and then just to kind of touch on the centralization um, once more, by keeping everything in one folder, it makes it easy to, to automate it as well. Um, I, I have a lot of scripts that just will automatically process whatever data hasn't already been processed. Um, that way you can just run a script. You don't have to know what was recorded or what, what hasn't been analyzed yet. Um, by just keeping everything in like set folders, um, it can just check for you to see like what files have not been processed yet and then process only those files. Um, and then in addition to this, by being very rigorous with how you name your files, um, you can then use things like strings to, to pull in 
data like from individual files um, or like combine like particular types of data together very easily. But if you were inconsistent with your naming, like this kind of approach would be impossible. Okay, so now I kind of discuss some of the, the general approaches. Um, if anyone has any questions about the talk so far, now would be a good time to talk because uh, up next I'm going to talk more specifically about the, the pipeline I made for the TBT system. All right, so. Um, hey, Adam, I had a question. Yeah. I was just, I was just curious. Um, when you were talking about like combining your two or like even up to four types of data streams using this uniform data format, um, I was just wondering like and curious, like how are you even syncing the data in like a temporal stream? Because like sometimes they're collected at different frequencies or sometimes like you hit start at like a later date. So yeah. I was just wondering like, how your system was set up so that if you did have raw metasociates data, did you like send a start signal to your fiber photometry data at the very least? Yeah. That's a great uh, question. I'll touch on the, the TDT stuff in particular um, extensively okay. uh, in a moment. But yeah, so I think the easiest way to do that is you need some sort of common variable between the two of them. Um, so either having your behavioral systems be sending pulses to your recording systems um, or vice versa. But I usually do it the first way. So I have with my Metasociates, my Arduino, Eat the Vision, whatever, it sends information to my Enscopics, the 2P, the um, TDT system that like codes certain events or you can have it just be a ticker and then you can use those to then synchronize your data sets. Um, I, I'm, I don't like to use like the trigger to start just because I always worry about um, drift over time because um, I've seen that in systems before. Great, thank you. Okay. So with fiber photometry, we have the raw photosensor signals and then we have our behavior um, oftentimes. Um, the easy one is like when the, the behavior is like already uh, time stamped and can be like like a, um, sent to the TDT system with like TTLs, like little electrical pulses. Um, the more difficult ones are going to be ones where you're like hand scoring something. Um, uh, but eventually, like you need to have that in some sort of uh, uh, um, like some sort of time stamp that you can then feed into your analysis. But for today, I'm going to be focusing primarily just on the, the kind of systems that send, uh, can send TTLs. So the TDT is great because it has this wonderful DB25 connector on the front, um, which you can connect directly to your Metasociate system. Um, and your Metasociate system can then uh, time lock events that can be collected during the actual acquisition of your uh, photosensor signals. Um, but the same can be done with the Arduino as well, um, or, or, or like any other sort of hardware that has like some sort of TTL. You could just use a converter. Um, for those who don't know, the DB25 connector is broken up into three ports. Um, port C is like the most standard where each, all eight are independent bits. So they're all measuring like high and low um, and they can record like when the onset of each one of those uh, or an offset of each of those pulses. Um, byte A and byte B are very unique compared to how most systems uh, record events. Um, so these are instead of being individual bits is a single eight bit number. Um, so uh, imagine you send over eight pins, uh, these numbers using binary. So 259 and 108. When the TDT system detects a change, it then records uh, an actual number at that port. The advantage here is that instead of just having eight values that you can record or eight events you can record, with each one of these bytes, you can record 256 events. So using this, like there's like really no limit to the number of events that you can record. And there's like no excuse for having to like manually track time um, 
and, and run the risk of having any error introduced at that point. Um, the uh, the system's already like incredibly powerful at tracking events. Um, when you look at the raw data, um, they have TGT has a really wonderful Python package and a MATLAB package as well. Um, it breaks your data up into a structure. Our epochs store all of our event information. You get like a different uh, stream here for each one of the, the ports that you defined in Synapse um, that corresponds with your eight um, bits on port C and then the, the two other uh, uh, ports as well. And then it also contains like some general info, like the start time of your session, uh, the path of your file. Um, but the data we most care about are the streams. So within here, you get one uh, structure for every demodulated signal that you collected. Um, and then within here, uh, you have your raw values um, uh, as data within, within this uh, structure. So this formats, actually like pretty great as far as like raw formats go from um, different systems, uh, but uh, it's not in a format that I personally like to, to like to work with. Um, so the first step in my process is to tidy that data. So I have one folder that contains all my TDT blocks, which are the, the individual recording sessions. And then there's a uh, pre-processing script that's run to convert that data from structures into a, a tidy format, so just a flat data format. Um, I talked about this in my last talk, but I just want to mention uh, the kind of the definition of tidy data again. So for tidy data, uh, each variable forms a column, and each observation forms a row, um, and then you have a different table for each type of data. So the advantage of this is it allows you to join data very easily. Um, joining to, to the left of other data frames, and then also combine across sessions by um, putting data, like, like binding rows, essentially. So when uh, from the user's perspective, all you need to uh, know is that you enter a directory of the raw um, data, and you enter the directory of the extracted data. And then it just converts these structures into a number like four different uh, files. Um, one is going to be your streams, and then another is going to be your events. Um, and it is tidy format, so we only have one data frame for all of them. So we have like let's say all for your first signal stacked on top of all for your second signal uh, for every demodulated signal within your uh, data set. And then the same thing goes for your epoch. So these are your events, and again, like you have all your events for the first photo or the first uh, input on top of the second on top of the third. And then you just have the name or the identity here as a variable. So that first step is like completely agnostic like we were talking about earlier. It just takes that raw data and automatically chunks through it and converts it into a format that's easier to work with. Um, the next one is not completely agnostic. It just uses the, the log um, and then a uh, defined event filter. Um, so this is where we kind of do a lot of the pre-processing that people who do uh, TDT, or I guess just any fiber photometry should be familiar with. So this is where we need to take our, our fitted signals and then also uh, convert it to some sort of normalized, normalized signal. Um, to do this in an automated fashion, I use a, a data log. Um, this is the same log as this, it's just transposed, so it'll be easier to read. Um, the kind of critical uh, value that you use to track the observation is the block name up here. So this is just the name that you define your block in the TDT um, uh, file when you save it. Then we specify the identity for each of the, um, the port uh, 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 bits here. Um, with the text here for the name. So this is the advantage here is that um, if everything's hooked up uh, incorrectly, you can change the names here in order to change how the analysis proceeds. You don't need to go back in and start editing the raw data, for example. Um, you also can specify the identity for the two TDT banks, so the two fibers. 
And then uh, we have a bunch of analysis parameters down here. Um, the most important being like, what are the identities of our signals? What are the identities of our controls? And then kind of like, how are we smoothing the data, fitting the data, and then downsampling it. Um, but because they're all defined here, you can very easily just copy it down day after day if you're going to keep your analysis the same. Um, it's easy to set up in advance, but if at any point you need to go back and then reanalyze it, again, you could just change these values and re-execute the script. So when this is executed, um, it's going to uh, process all the files that are in the extracted folder that are not yet in the process folder. Um, unless you specify it to, to overwrite. Um, and then it goes through uh, each one of those files and then and processes them individually and saves the output in the, the directory processed. Um, and if you re-execute it, um, when you've already processed all the data, you're presented just with a little notification saying that um, all the data has already been processed. Adam, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so if you want to, let's say, uh, analyze um, time frequency data. So let's say I want to analyze whether or not this signal at um, uh, one event is uh, based on specific frequencies. So like a uh, one hertz signal versus a 20 hertz signal. If you pre-process the data, to downsample, I see that that will, I can see that that might um, mess with those frequencies. So is it cumbersome to reprocess the data? Um, uh, so in your previous slide, you showed a downsampling rate of 20, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say I want whole data, let's say um, each TDT has its own unique sampling rate. So it's 1017 point blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But notice each one has, each TDT system has its own unique rate um, that's not um, common across TDT machines. Mm -hmm. So how would you be able to find a common ground there? So I guess one option is within the, uh, if you look inside the streams, it specifies what the um, sampling rate is. So if you just want to keep maximum, you could just feed this in, or I guess you could feed in like an NA for the downsampling. I haven't programmed that in, but you could do that. Um, you could just set this NA and then it won't downsample. Um, or you can set it to an arbitrarily high uh, frequency. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the easiest way would just be to not downsample it at that point. Right, okay, thanks. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go for it. So Adam, what about, you know, following up on that last question, what if I wanted, um, so my current data analysis pi pipeline in Python for fiber photometry data, I have it spit out both a raw file and essentially a downsampled file. Yeah. Uh, how hard is it to adapt your processing code to spit out a second file? So I guess right now the way it's written, like you could already do that. So you could just take, let me go to my table. You could just duplicate each one of these rows and then have one with the downsample and one without. And then you could already have the outcome that you're, you're asking for. Um, you could also, it would be very easy to, in this function, add that in as an additional output. Um, instead of just like saving the, the downsample data, you could just have it also save the other data. That would just be like adding one line of code. Perfect, thank you very much. So, um, so yeah. The, Again, from the user's perspective, it's just one one line. You just specify this and run this, and then it does all the pre-processing for you. But let's just quickly look at some of the functions. I won't go into the functions. I, I can if people want, but um, there's just a couple of main ones that are, are executed. Um, the first is it performs a moving average. Then it performs the fitting, the subtraction, the normalization that people are familiar with um, here within this uh, function. 
then it downsamples it, then it finds, filters the, the epochs to events that you care about for the peri event time histogram, and then it uh, calculates that peri event time histogram um, from the data. Uh, this is actually, uh, the data gets downsampled here independently as well. Um, it reads in the, the raw fitted data. Um, but for your question, Jennifer, you could easily have it save the uh, this data here, the non-downsampled version of it. Um, and so how does it like loop across your file? So it, it loops uh, for each signal within your data set. So for my data, I'm recording um, both uh, GCAMP and JRCAMP1B, so two different signals. It goes through and then performs everything on each of those signals independently. So that way they can be fitted to the control on their own. And then it does it for each fiber that you have. Um, and then uh, uh, it just goes through each block name after that. So, and again, that's all specified here within your, your data log. So the advantage from this is that just using these toggles here, you can analyze any kind of configuration of data um, as you could want. Um, so you could do like one fiber experiments, two fiber experiments, like one to three different signals, um, and you can use unique controls. So you could use the 405 for the control, or you could change that to 560, and you could use like a static red floor four as a control. Again, all automated based on like the input that you provide in this table. So at that point, we have all of our process data. And this is kind of like the, the bulk of the pre-processing is, is, is all complete at this point. Um, I especially want to look through like what the output data looks like, um, because I think the structure of it, is a, it makes doing analysis fairly easily. Um, so to read in data, um, I was working with a rotating graduate student. Um, and we were able to produce a lot of data, but we were struggling to, to read it in in a dynamic manner. Um, so now I, I have a script that just uh, creates a list of files with, with uh, like specified suffixes, um, and you can filter it uh, to, for the import. So you can import particular files based on the strings present in them. Um, so you can automatically read in just the chunk of data that you need. So just because you have all of your data in your data process folder doesn't mean you need to like read it all in. You could just read in like chunks of it that you care about. For the streams, um, we have uh, the observation is the block um, crossed with the bank, crossed with the signal ID, and then time. Um, so that's kind of like shown visually here. Um, and it's like the real tables up, up here. And then everything to the right of time is an, a, a value that corresponds to one of our many different kinds of signals that we might care about. Um, for the peri-event time histogram data, it's the same thing except for now we have relative time and we have trial number. So again, like everything's just like kind of stacked on itself. So you have like potentially all of the data from an entire experiment just in one data frame, and you can then chisel it down by using filters and then you can like perform like grouped averages everything on that uh, like large data frame um so to the right of time are all of our dependent uh variables um these are the ones i have now but there's you can always add more very easily um just with a, a couple lines of code you can plot what they all look like um, everyone who's done fiber photometry will be familiar with these that you have like your control um, channel, your signal, your fitted, uh, your polynomial fits, the subtractions from there, then delta f over f, z score, all that. So all of it's present within the same data frame, just in case you want to analyze it any number of ways. This is obviously like uh, not computationally efficient. Um, I think in the long run, uh, I'm probably going to have some sort of filter just like return only the ones you actually care about. But the main reason I'm bringing this up is that um, I know people often want to compare like what like delta F over F looks like compared with Z scores. 
and then comparing like the different forms of normalization by keeping in this tidy format, it makes it very easy to like very quickly compare them uh, side by side. And also imagine if you wanted to do some new form of normalization, all you have to do is modify this function here. And then the way it's written is that anything to the right of time automatically gets included in all other like analyses from there and all other like uh, functions from there. So once you add in a new column, it'll automatically be kept in with the, the rest of your data. So something I'm working on now, um, which isn't complete, so I don't have much to show is creating like automated plotting for the pre-processing step. So after like extracting everything now, I have a script that automatically um, uh, plots your signal, your control, all your fits and normalizations, and then as well as your, your peri-event time histograms. Um, this is all kind of like pretty straightforward stuff that I'm sure uh, everyone's already been working with. But the nice thing here is that once I have it set up with the different types of configurations, you can automatically have like a snapshot of, of what your recording session looked like. Um, I think, yeah, so just as a very kind of quick overview, um, I think uh, I'm a little bit ahead of time, which is always good. Um, the kind of general principles that I outlined is uh, centralized storage, um, using tidy data logs to like log the data located in that centralized storage and control your, your functions. And then the, the use of agnostic pre-processing, which is just pre-processing independent of, of your experimental or recording design. And then uh, finally, the having a uniform uh, process format that can then uh, allow you to apply the same analysis to, to different types of data easily. And then for our specific pipeline, um, the, uh, the, this kind of shows like this, these principles in action where from the user's perspective, you only have two lines of code and your data log, and then it will automatically process all of the data that you have uh, included within your uh, uh, folder and log. Um, and one thing I'm working on is putting all of this onto GitHub. Um, currently it's private because it's not quite uh, finished yet, but everything that I'm, I'm working on now for our methods paper, but everything I'm working on for the recording and everything going forward, it's my goal is to try to keep it on GitHub. So eventually it should be easy to disseminate. So we should get some easy uh, reproducibility across labs. So we're not all kind of like banging our heads against the wall doing the same thing. And with that, I'd like to thank the super lab, um, especially the people that have I've been able to bounce ideas off with uh, in regards to programming. I'd also like to thank Raj, who was very useful as I was setting up uh, TDT in the lab. And then I'd also like to thank uh, Kaylin, who was a rotating graduate student who worked with me when we were setting up the, the pre-processing pipeline at the very beginning, provided a lot of good user feedback. And then I'd also like to specifically thank Charles and Abby for organizing this uh, this weekly event. And yeah, and if anyone has questions, I'm, I'm happy to chat. Yeah, so we have time for several questions. Hey Adam, I just wanted to say I found this very useful and I hope to employ it in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I might come downstairs and ask you a couple of questions one day, especially I was texting Jordan. I was like, have you seen this? <laughs> I really like this data log. It's super like such an efficient way of going through all your data sets. So um, I'll come bother you when I start thinking about it again. <laughs> yeah, happy to Thank help. Thank you. Because you guys are using TDT too, right? Yeah, so we're using TDT and then we use the GUI that Scott built that does batch processing of like, you know, a bunch of files. 
I think what we get stuck on, which I hope to talk to you about, is um, renaming those files, moving all those files into one central location, and then doing um, your, your processing. It's sort of like where we can get kind of stuck in, in terms of like the labor intensity, but I'm definitely guilty of putting all those like variables at the very beginning of my code and like having my rotation students or undergrads like type in all the variable names and stuff. So, and then like if something is off, then like the whole code shuts down. So I really like the idea of the, the log. Thanks. Yeah, yeah and for, uh, for Meta Associates, I have, um, if, if that's the data you're trying to batch process, I already have a bunch of code for that too I could share. Yeah, that would be a lot of help actually. Um, because for the most part, we have all of our behavioral events tagged directly into the fiber photometry data set. Um, so the GUI like does the, the batch processing using those epoch events that are marked. But mm. in case we ever wanted to look somewhere else, it's not automatically encoded, right? Um, a way to quickly analyze that associate, extract all the meta associate data would be great. Yeah, Adam, great talk. Um, so I feel like I asked you this before, but I'm forgetting what you said. But um, so in the beginning, when I was starting learning how to analyze my data, I made the mistake of <laughs> uh, bringing in the full uh, data from TDT into R. And that completely crashed R because it was trying to compute like gigantic amounts of data and the memory just couldn't handle it. Is that ever going to be an issue? I know you use the feather format, but if you're using MATLAB, um, I don't, I looked up whether you can easily just put it in a feather format to do that, but I, I don't think that's readily available. Is, uh, feather format the only way to make R handle that kind of uh, one kilohertz kind of data? So, I mean, there's other compressed forms of uh, data that, that read and write really quick, similar to feather. Um, I mean, H5 is an example. Um, the uh, Issues with memory like would be independent of that. Like sometimes, if you, I can definitely read in enough data that my computer can't handle the data frames. Um, what you would have to do at that point is have to modify your code to do the pre-processing or the the processing to get your data closer to being in the final format before you start combining across um, uh, files. Um, but for 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 Everything I've done in TDT has been downsampled, um, so I haven't I haven't run into any issues. Even though I'm combining across like I don't know, like 50, 60 files, like I don't run into issues with memory. I see. So what uh, you downsampled to twenty uh, times less amount of data. So does no, typically I, for like an hour worth of data, how much how many data points do you think you get? Like, um, I couldn't check. So I'll, I can show you like the size of it anyways. Um, oh wait, this is the wrong folder. So these are one of these, all four of these make, make up one recording session. And the largest ones, like what, three megabytes. So, right. Yeah, so, yeah, fairly yeah. small. And it's downsampled to 20 hertz. Like you specify the frequency that you want it to be. Um, right. The other thing that like has actually like been a huge time saver for me is downsampling to like one hertz, then setting everything up, getting the way you like it, and then executing it with the higher frequency. Does that I answer see. your question? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, data frames in general, like R works very well with them. Like I've worked with like multi-million length uh, 
files or data frames without much trouble, um, just so long as your computer has the memory to, to hold it there. Um, otherwise, you have to just yeah, chunk it out into smaller pieces. Adam, quick question for me. Um, uh, so it seems like you are, at least from your presentation, that there's some uh, processing that happens in R as well as in Python. Is there, is it all for your like final pipeline, um, is it all in one programming language? And if it's in like multiple, do you have like a unifying script that uh, like automatically goes from one, um, to the other? Yeah, it's a good question. So right now, yeah, I have to do the very first step executed in Python. And then from there, I just execute uh, R. Um, the, I want to have it all in one script eventually. So R Studio has the ability to run Python documents. Um, it would just have to execute it. It wouldn't have to like save any data from it directly. Um, I haven't set that up yet, but that's the plan is to have it do that. I don't know. I, I imagine PyCharm could probably do that even more easily. So I might just like, yeah, use that instead. Have you, yeah. do you have any experience with executing like different languages from a single script? Um, not extensively if I, uh, if I like uh, think off the top of my head, but that's, that's actually kind of the reason why I asked is um, in the future, I, I can imagine that a situation like that could happen to me. Um, I was thinking that uh, one potential solution would be to, I don't know if this would work, I guess, like uh, create like a bash, like mm. a script that calls like the Python script, um, like a line for Python and other lines for R. That would probably be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, I think that that's a good idea. Because then I guess uh, the users don't necessarily need to uh, install like R Studio or Absolutely. And then, yeah, it could just be base R and base Python to do that. Yeah, I like the sound of that. Yeah. Do you know if you can call bash files or run bash files from uh, PyCharm? Not sure. But Veronica said that you could probably use a Docker container or a virtual machine. Yeah, that, that, I think that um, that could be a solution. So I feel like I've, I've, I tried looking at Docker and it seemed like the setup. Um, was uh, kind of extensive, not intuitive, but I think you put forth the uh, effort at the time, it might pay off. I think it kind of depends on the complexity. I, I could see like issues with uploading large data sets to the container, but uh, if you're using like a really simple container, they're actually pretty easy to use, but the documentation isn't great, but I've had some experience and could potentially like try to do a tutorial or something on that. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know of their existence and then that's about the extent of my knowledge about Docker. Yeah, the only drawback now is that I think like they used to have a repository with pretty much unlimited use for academics, but now they've kind of limited that. So mm -hmm. I'd have to, I'd want to check if there's like an alternative that works pretty similarly that has, that's more open source, I guess. Have you uh, thought about compressing your video data? Because I know you do a lot of deep lab that kind of stuff. So is compressing it bad for it? Um, that's yeah. So with imaging, it's like a tricky because like when you compress it, you lose information. Um, I mean, we still store everything in H H5 format, um, but that's not actually like really compressing the, the, the data. Um, I'll often use like a Python script to convert TIFFs into JPEGs and JPEGs are small enough to, to work with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't try to compress beyond that. Yeah, the, the, no matter what, with a 2P data is the same way. Like it's just, it's really large, like the data sets and there's not much you can do about it.
Any other questions? Okay, with that, uh, thanks Adam for the fantastic talk. I learned a lot and I think uh, this might be the final push for me to implement um, some of this like uh, systematic, well, I mean, I guess I do have some already, but uh, implement this more um, thoroughly. But uh, yeah, thanks again. And I'll see everyone uh, next time. Thanks Charles.